The Supreme Court just heard oral arguments in the case of the Federal Election Commission vs. Ted Cruz vs. Senate. Uh oh, Ted. But don't worry, if you leave right now, you still have time to flee to Cancun. Now, in maybe the weirdest hill to die on, Ted Cruz just intentionally violated an anti corruption campaign finance law that he found to be unconstitutional. Now, this is really civil disobedience's sketchy cousin we're dealing with today. Now, for some background, there is an incredibly specific law in the books that says, alright, candidates, listen up. You can lend your campaign as much of your own money as you want. If you're rich, go out, just buy a bunch of campaign ads, have some fun with it. So far, no problem. Well, maybe a problem, but no law against it. Freedom of speech. So what next? Well, the campaign you just lent all that money to can pay you back all the money you loaned it. I mean, it's a loan after all. Still no legal problems. The gavel comes down when the election is actually over. After the election is over, the campaign can use new fundraising to collect no more than an additional $250,000 to pay back the candidate's loans. Now the idea is, you don't want someone like Ted Cruz for Senate calling a bunch of large donors and saying, yeah, we need more money. No, 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 not for the election. That's over. We just want to take your cash and give it directly to Ted Cruz. Now this carries with it some huge potential for either abuse and corruption or free speech infringement and overregulation, depending on which side of the argument you find yourself on. Hey, you'll get a clearer picture of all the issues as I swirl my way towards the core of this debate. So in this case, before the election, Ted Cruz cut Ted Cruz for Senate a fat check for $260,000. You'll notice $10,000 more than that $250,000 threshold. Hey, someone had to fund the guy and it certainly wasn't going to be Texans. Then after the election, Ted Cruz's campaign started soliciting donations to pay Ted Cruz the candidate back that money. And what do you know, they found entities willing to give the whole $260,000 to Cruz. Now under current law, that is undisputably illegal. $260,000 is $10,000 more than that $250,000 post-election fundraising cap. So okay, case closed, right? Short episode, let's issue that fine and I'm gonna start begging you guys to like and subscribe. Well, not quite. The whole point here isn't to determine whether Ted Cruz broke the law or not, he intentionally did break the law. Instead, the question is whether this law that Ted Cruz intentionally violated is in itself unconstitutional and should be removed. Now, the major debate here is actually whether this law covers a legitimate anti-corruption concern or is arbitrary, infringing on First Amendment rights, and not provably fighting a quid pro quo corruption concern. So the best corruption case study that the defense could point to was that of, and this might be a little awkward for Democrats, California Democratic Representative Grace Napolitano. When she ran for Congress, she gave her campaign an $150,000 loan at a whopping 18% interest rate. From there, she collected tens of thousands of dollars in personal income on top of that principal by charging that double digit interest on the money that she had lent her campaign years ago and turning around and soliciting donations from Washington lobbyists to pay herself back. Even worse, the fundraisers she was raising all this money from were hosted by Capitol Hill lobbying firms whose clients included several transportation interests. And Napolitano just happens to be a member of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee as well as the chairwoman of the Water and Power Subcommittees of the Natural Resources Committee. Yeah, not looking great. They were repaying her campaign debts on top of her 18% interest rate which cash which was going to her. Nothing to see here folks. Now, fortunately for Napolitano, the total amount her campaign had raised post-election and paid back to her post-election was $220,000, which you may notice is under that $250,000 threshold, so technically, totally legal. 
Still, that's probably the best example of how these campaign loans could lead to an environment that's open to corruption. Now to go back to Ted Cruz's legal goals today, he wants to eliminate that cap so that elected candidates can run up unlimited election debts and then collect unlimited repayment cash from donors on the back end. So what is the case against this law? Well, and to the conservative justices. There were three main schools of thought that supported Ted Cruz's case against this post-election campaign cash. First, can't prove this fights corruption. Second, free speech. And third, $250,000 cap on after the election? That's all arbitrary as heck. So first, corruption. Can't prove anything. This is all based on assumption. Now this line of questioning was best represented by Amy Coney Barrett. She cited Cruz's contention that the repayment of his loan does not enrich him personally because he's no better off than he was before. It's paying a loan, not lining his pockets. Now of course to accept this argument, you have to ignore the fact that, well, some candidates are charging double digit interest rates on the loans that they cut to their campaigns, and then collecting and soliciting a lot of funds from lobbyists in order to pay themselves back years later. I mean, if, for example, I'm negotiating with myself for the goal of running up the most debt possible and then passing it off to donors to pay myself back, that's going to look less like a negotiation and a lot more like an auction. <clears throat> Stephen for president. I'll give you $10 at a 10% interest rate. I'll take it, but how about 15%? You know what? I'm feeling 20%. 30 Heck! 100% final offer. Now go call some lobbyists to get me paid back. Now Barrett continued with a more targeted argument, citing findings of the lower court that the government had introduced no evidence of an actual quid pro quo corruption generated from this law. That is, politicians trading favors for contributions. And oh god, I'm getting flashbacks to 2018 again. We're going back to defining the difference between quid pro quo and do me a favor first. Now it's 100% true that deals where lobbyists say, I'll give you money in return for you voting on this bill, those do not exist in the context of today's case. The lawmakers on the transportation committee getting loans repaid by the transportation lobbyists there were no specific demands attached to those funds. Maybe the lobbyists were just super worried about her personal finances and wanted to ensure that her campaign was still able to stay solvent more than 10 years after the election was over. Now, the liberal argument against this was best laid out by Justice Kagan, who said that the entire point of this law is, we start getting worried when people start repaying the candidate's indebtedness because that's just another way of putting money into his pockets. To Kagan, such a scenario screams quid pro quo corruption. Basically, maybe we can't empirically prove that removing a cap on how much campaigns can raise from donors post-election will lead to quid pro quo corruption, but it certainly isn't going to help the situation. Lock a cat in a box with some uranium and poison in it, the cat might stay alive, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea to try it. That's right, Schrodinger. Now, the second concern was that of a candidate's free speech being potentially violated by this law. Now, this argument was best presented by Justice Kavanaugh, who pointed out that this limits put a chill on a candidate's ability to loan his campaign his own money. It requires a candidate to choose between loaning their campaigns more than $250 knowing that, well, maybe they might not get some of that money back, and not loaning the campaign that money at all. Now, The idea here is that candidates in America very, very much have a First Amendment free speech right concerning how they spend their own money on their campaigns. Now, despite the fact that you can still lend and spend as much of your own money as you want to on your campaign, he would argue that limiting the amount you can raise post-election in order to pay yourself back through fundraising might put an arbitrary block on how much a candidate would be willing to lend their own campaign. 
Well, I'm looking at the numbers here, and I could give you guys $260,000, but I'm never seeing that last $10,000 again. So I might limit my own free speech, because it's not so free in this case, and only give you $250,000. This was presented by Kavanaugh as a potentially unconstitutional suppression of a candidate's free speech rights. And lastly, there was a prolonged debate about the arbitrary nature of all this stuff. Post-election, pre-election, several thousand dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, a lobbyist at the end of the day is still giving your campaign a bunch of money that, in some cases, going back to you. Why are we drawing the line here and saying, all right, at this very specific juncture, that becomes illegal. You're telling me that the first $250,000, well, that's a okay. That $250,000 first dollar, though, circle the wagons. And then these concerns were addressed in a few different ways. First, the simplest answer out there. All right, maybe you don't like the law. I agree, it's very arbitrary. Still, this is a law that was passed by Congress to fight corruption. You might not like where the chips have fallen, but the law is incredibly black and white in this case. There's really no room for judicial interpretation. The choices here truly are bad law or bad Ted Cruz. You either throw out the law or accept it. For a more complicated explanation of Congress's rationale when they actually pass the bill, let's go to the liberal justices. Now, Justice Sotomayor best summed up the before-after election disparity by pointing out, why would someone want to contribute money to a candidate after he has already been elected? The money won't be used to promote a candidate because the candidate has already won. You're not buying TV time, paying for ads, or any of that other stuff. You're literally just giving a politician cash. Now, Ted Cruz's lawyer had a very interesting rebuttal to this point. If I go to a restaurant tonight and pay for my meal with a credit card, a month from now, I'm going to have to repay that credit card company for the meal. That's what these post-election contributions that actually retire bets pay for. You make it rain with your own money while you're running, under the assumption that, after the election, you'll be able to put it on a lobbyist credit card. Sure, they aren't paying for your advertising fees directly, but your ability to pay for those advertising fees hinges on your post-election ability to approach those lobbyists for campaign debt relief contributions. Now, the other point of contention was the arbitrary nature of this $250,000 cutoff. The answer here largely circles back to the simple Congress answer I gave you guys earlier. Love it or hate it, that's the number Congress wrote down and handed to us. Congress was trying to balance two interests when they passed the law and laid out that number. The ability of a candidate to recoup some losses from their campaign, and the ability of a candidate to avoid incurring such large amounts of debts that they would be holding to donors post-election. Now, Congress has made similar arbitrary calculations in similar election law places that people have not objected to. For example, limiting an individual's campaign contributions to $2,900. Didn't want to make it a clean $3,000. Okay. No, that gives donors a bit of free speech, but not enough that you're just buying politicians off. In a similar vein, as they mentioned, Congress settled that number at $250,000, and unless you want to overrule that law, well, that's the number. Now, in the end, there are two sides to this argument. One side that says $250,000 cap on post-election fundraising has no evidence of directly linking it to quid pro quo corruption, limits a candidate's First Amendment rights to loan their campaigns unlimited amounts of money because they're unsure whether they will be able to recoup unlimited amounts of money back later on after the campaign's over, and finally, it's just such an arbitrary thing that Congress put together and passed. Now, the other side is arguing that while simply allowing candidates to solicit an uncapped amount of funds from lobbyists that will be paid directly into their banking accounts at any time, including when they're in office, well, that all might create an environment ripe for corruption. 
Because of that, Congress has a legitimate and compelling interest in regulating it and putting in that cap, so we should leave it in place and Ted Cruz broke that law. Here's your fine. Who will win this debate? We're not sure, but most court watchers suspect that the cap will be removed by either a 6-3 vote or a 5-4 vote, depending on which side Roberts joins. Good news, someone's about to make a whole lot of money. Bad news, probably won't be us. Unless of course you're planning on running for office, giving yourself a high interest loan, and then getting it paid off on someone else's dime. I just hope that, in the end of the day, Ted Cruz for Senate doesn't end up being the next Citizens United. If it does though, I think we're gonna know who to blame. Dude's name is right in the title. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put on my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also, if you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up and remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.